Greetings to you all and uh, welcome. My name is Michael Spath and I'm the Executive Director of the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace, a member of the Global Kairos for Justice Coalition, ICAD USA, and the United Church of Christ Palestine Israel Network. So Hanny, welcome. Thank you, thank you, Michael. It's nice to be here. I really enjoyed reading your book, uh, your recently published book. It's entitled, Giving Up is Not an Option, Memoirs of a Palestinian American. So, so I want to get right to it. Uh, Hanny, uh, you left Nablus after high school in 1983. At the age of 18, emigrated to the US only to return 35 years later in 2018. Those of us who had the a privilege to travel to Nablus, and as I told you, I'll be there this June, know of its rich history. And of course, we love Nablus Kanafe. Uh, and you told me recently that uh, you make your own uh, in, at, uh, in, in uh, Macon, Georgia. So uh, for you, Hanny, you say, quote, Nablus, the city of my birth, with a population of nearly 130,000 is engraved in my mind and soul. There's not one day that goes by without a memory of that ancient and beautiful city. Tell us about Hanny and Nablus. Uh, that history obviously began with my birth and uh, uh, my upbringing in that city, which uh, uh, hosts, uh, people of multiple faiths, Christians, Muslims, and Samaritans. And uh, throughout my uh, years at Nablus, I could only witness the love and the harmony uh, through which the uh, uh, members of the same society live. And I think that uh, the schooling I had in Nablus, the teachers I had, uh, and of course the support of my family, especially my parents, made Nablus the very special place that will always be part of my life. All your schooling was in Nablus and you said to me uh, earlier that um, these uh, teachers and your friends, and by the way, uh, your book richly illustrated with pictures of mentors and friends from throughout your life, uh, that they really were instrumental in, in um, what strengthening you uh, in dealing with your uh, disability? Absolutely, they were all supportive of me. I mean, I was, I was noticeably disabled. I mean, everybody could, could see that I, uh, I was uh, a person with a disability uh, and it was visible and all of them uh, were very, very supportive and they were very encouraging. Uh, and to the point when before leaving, the Middle East before leaving Nablus in 1983, uh, several of my teachers came to me and they said, Hanny, we know that you're going to leave us, but I'm, we know that you're going to make us proud. And I carried that promise, uh, you know, inside I felt that I'm obligated to carry that legacy of my own teachers and, and do the best I can in, in my life as well. You, you know, you... Uh... You um, uh, raised the issue of the religious diversity of Nablus. Uh, on the one hand, you say, quote, Nablus is well known for the harmony between its inhabitants, Muslims, Christians, and Samaritans. It's that diversity that I believe made the city a cradle of peaceful coexistence. Yet you also, you also uh, in your book say, Living among Muslims, Christians, Samaritans, believers in God and atheists, I felt a desperate need to find my own truth, but I didn't know where to look for answers. There were simply too many gods and all of them see seemed different. So talk to us about this mix, you know, in your own, in your own identity, about how, how this interfaith context shaped your values and worldview. I think the more perspectives we have on any issue in life, the better equipped we are to deal with life. And that's the way I look at, that's how I perceive uh, productive citizenship. I think the more knowledge we have about how others view the world uh, gives us more power to deal with this world. And uh, living you know, within a society 
that uh, uh, that is multi-religious, uh, multi-ethnic, uh, you know, gives me or gave me perspective on how to deal with disability. And nevertheless, sometimes I was not fully convinced with explanations that were given to me. Uh, you know, each theology has a way of understanding about uh, the world, about views, different views about the world, including disability. Uh, and uh, I basically found that my own search for the truth mattered the most. Uh, I did not dismiss other uh, perspectives on the contrary. I think I benefited from other perspectives, uh, but I think, uh, and I spoke about those in my book as well, the interpretation of suffering and how we look at suffering in general. But, but overall, I was determined to find my own truth via my own search. And I think that I gathered my own strength uh, through that search that I have uh, undertaken. You know, uh, I don't know that we in the West really understand that kind of rich, multi-religious diversity in Palestine. Um, for example, when, when I go to Nablus, we visit Jacob's Well Church, of course, you know, you, you have to do that. We, uh, I told you one of our mission partners is in the, in, uh, the old city. It's, uh, it serves uh, predominantly a Muslim community in the old city, the very poorest of the people in Nablus. And then we go up to uh, uh, Mount Gerizim and, and visit with the Samaritan community there. And, and this rich mix, I mean, you interacted as a, as a, as a boy in school uh, with, with people of every one of the religious traditions, yes? Yes, I'm still also con in contact with them. My, my science teacher that I mentioned in my book, Ishmael, uh, the Samaritan, he passed away three weeks ago. And uh, uh, I am in touch with his son, uh, Izzat, and I called Izzat while he was in the hospital uh, sitting beside his father during his last few days. And he told me, Hani, my dad is not doing well at all. And I told him, is that please tell your dad how much I love him. And I do uh, hold all of my teachers dearly to my heart. And I, uh, everyone who passed away, I made sure that I give them tribute. Uh, I, I made sure that uh, uh, all of my colleagues and friends know that I care about, and I, I continue to care about the living among them. Many of them have passed away, but uh, I think that the legacy uh, remains with uh, those generations that they have impacted throughout the years. The, fir the first part of your life, you describe uh, as a search for identity. A and this is what you wrote. As a young boy, I was being shattered by the misfortunes of war and injustice seemingly endless questions concerning my disability, the Israeli occupation, and my own social identity as a Palestinian, all of which haunted me day and night. I was a child with a Christian background living in a predominantly Muslim society, and my confusion regarding both my personal and social identity was palpable. I didn't really know who I was, and I was bewildered by the prospects and challenges that confronted me daily. Throughout my childhood years, and then as a young adult, questions concerning freedom, independence, body image, personhood, and the purpose and meaning of life confronted me daily. That was a profound insight, by the way, now as you look back at your life. Talk to us a little bit about this search for identity uh, for you as a child and as a, a young person? That struggle obviously stemmed uh, out of two major influences. The influence of having a disability, born with a disability and living with it every day. And obviously uh, being born uh, and raised uh, during an Israeli occupation. And uh, therefore in, in terms of the shaping of my identity, Freedom mattered the most. Freedom, the physical freedom, along with my freedom as a citizen, uh, as a person. Uh, uh, so I think that lacking the two, because I was not able to, to run like others. I was not able to walk like others. 
uh, you know, I had my own difficulties walking and, and, and uh, I talk about how my father used to carry me on his back uh, daily from and to school. Uh, but so these two elements, I mean, when you are born uh, thirsty for freedom, it, it, that thirst has an impact on you as a person. Uh, and I think that uh, as a result, I decided to devote my life helping others achieve their freedom. I think there's nothing like freedom in this world, living freely. Uh, you know, yes, I was not able to, to walk and, and run like others, but in the end, I was able to obtain a wheelchair that allowed me to move around and, and gain my freedom in a different way. Uh, so I was always searching for alternatives uh, as I was developing my own identity. Uh, and of course, our, my national identity as a Palestinian was crushed by an occupation that uh, did not uh, allow for that uh, aspect to grow and prosper. Uh, nevertheless, uh, in the heart, I remain to be a Palestinian and now I'm a Palestinian American as well. So I hold American values dear as well. Uh, so I'm going to continue my search uh, for freedom and I'm going to continue helping others reach their goals to achieve freedom. We're going to talk. Thank you for that, Henny. Uh, that idea of freedom is is replete. I mean, it, it's on. It it drips from every page in your book. You can tell. Um, we're going to talk about your spinal muscular muscular atrophy (SMA) and advocacy for all people, especially young people with disabilities, in a little bit. We'll we'll talk about that in a little bit. But I want you to talk about uh, talk now about what you call growing up under one of the most brutal military occupations in the world. You just referred to it and its impact on your family. I mean, we, we, we those of us on the call know about the occupation, settler colonial agenda of Israel, uh, apartheid uh, in, you know, in general, but this impacted your family. Uh, your, 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 the lives of your grandparents, the life of your father and mother, and, and your life as well. Um, so t talk about maybe its impact more personally. Uh, there's no question that the uh, occupation has impacted, in my mind, not only the lives of the occupied, but also the lives of the occupier. But I'll speak about the lives of the occupied since I was under that uh, uh, occupation, living under that occupation. The Israeli occupation has touched the lives of every, almost every Palestinian living in, in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. Uh, I can recall uh, certain incidents uh, when the Israeli soldiers and the Israeli army uh, invaded schools, invaded my school. I can talk about uh, uh, collective uh, punishment measures that the Israeli army uh, takes, uh, you know, against the entire community. Uh, I can speak about personal experiences that uh, remain with me today. And uh, these, there were two of them that uh, I can speak of. Uh, yeah, but I think we'll get to those in just uh, a couple of minutes, as, as yeah. a matter of fact. Yeah. But, but over, overall, I think that the, the occupation, uh, you know, made the Palestinians a hostage. I mean, we, you can't travel without a permit. You can't, you can't uh, uh, exercise your, your you, you can't build a house without approval or permit. You can't, you know, house demolitions are, are practices uh, that the Israelis uh, follow. Uh, you know, they, just living under occupation is living under hell, hell-like conditions. I mean, they ask the different, the different aspects of normal daily living are absent. You're no longer, you're no longer able to, to travel freely. You're no longer able to live freely. You're no longer able to, uh, to exercise your, your, uh, your rights. You know, your rights are denied. Your political, uh, social, uh, rights are impacted, directed by that occupation. You talk about in your book about the uh, uh, se settlements 
and the violence of the settlers, and especially the growth of settl settlements, ironically, under Oslo, uh, uh, you know, and uh, just the injustice of the whole settler movement. You want to say a word about that? This is probably what has killed the Oslo Agreement, I think. I mean, the, the Oslo Agreement was supposed to uh, uh, transpire and become, you know, trans transform into a Palestinian state, at least bring about a Palestinian state in the West Bank and the other strip. That never has happened because of the, the settlement policies. Israel continued to build more illegal settlements. Israel did not care about the Oslo Agreement a bit in terms of expanding settlements, building new ones in the West Bank. And of course, uh, the, uh, the blockade of Gaza, which uh, is now nearly 15 or 16 years old. So it's just the, the way that the Palestinian communities is not able to breathe in, in any meaningful way to, it's not able to achieve independence in any meaningful way. Uh, and that settlement policies just continue and, and if settlements is Israel's expression of sovereignty uh, over the West Bank and East Jerusalem, then I don't think that peace is going to be uh, possible in any uh, time in the near future. You know, one of the more ins insightful, um, what, paradoxes uh, <clears throat> that you point to in your book is uh, Israel's beaches. And let me, let me just uh, uh, point out this, uh, this paradox. On the one hand, you describe a time of rich cultural diversity in the land of your birth. Quote, Israel society as truly a mosaic of different cultures. And you say you could see it on the beaches, different languages, traditions, nationalities, many of them survivors of the Holocaust or their descendants. Then on the other hand, you contrast that with, quote, the cruel irony taking place in plain sight, Jews worldwide invited to come to Israel and become citizens of the state, part of the Zionist agenda, which proved to be at the expense of Palestinian human and national rights, brutally occupying those territories and terrifying the Palestinian people. I mean, both of these present, right, uh, uh, at the same time. And you said, I could see it on the beaches present. Uh, tell us a little bit about this, this tragic, really, uh, uh, and dangerous paradox in Israel. It, it is tragic in the sense that uh, the, the, those who experience suffering are now exercising or have a role in exercising suffering on others. And, and I think that, that you know, the, 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 uh, the beaches uh, in Israel were... Uh, a reminder that uh, if uh, all the Jews in the world can come to Israel and declare it as a homeland, the Palestinians who have been living there for thousands of years uh, are denied that same right. Imagine living in your own homeland, not in a different country, and yet being uh, a prisoner in your own homeland. This is the irony. This is the, the thing that keeps me wonder. And, and think about you know, uh, how on earth that occupation is going to end. Uh, those speeches reminded me also of the diversity that I think that uh, uh, Israel has as a, as, as a country, but, but also the diversity that the world needs in terms of providing support for the Palestinian people. I think the world has to come together. Jews and non-Jews, Palestinians and non-Palestinians must come together and, and end that occupation, because I think in the end, that occupation is harming everyone involved. It is harming uh, uh, Israeli society to the point where Israel now is known as an apartheid state, not by my measures, but by measures of human rights organizations, major ones. And, uh, you know, yes, I was going there and I, I was, as a child, having fun, but as I grew up, I began to see the, the irony, you know, the irony that uh, somehow we have to find a way out of it. You know, you remind us really, and you just did again, you remind us in your book too, that before 1948, 
before 1948, uh, uh, Israel was a, uh, uh, a very multi-religious, multi-ethnic. I mean, Jews, Arabs, you know, uh, Muslims, and Christians—they all lived in relative harmony in their society. You know, absolutely. Yes. I mean, I mean, we're, we're all human beings. Period. So really, this is just. This is just since 1948, you know, that this is taking place. So, uh, 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 I mean, it's amazing, isn't it? Yes, it is amazing. And, and I think there is always hope. And I think that, that this is, you know, hope is, is, the, is the only weapon I live by uh, because I think uh, it gives us, it gives me a reason to continue to, uh, to promote justice and peace uh, in the Middle East, but also here in the United States as well. Yeah, and, I'm, uh, and I appreciate our friend Wally correcting me, of course, uh, before 1948, it was Palestine, not Israel. But Palestinian, Palestine was a very much a multi-ethnic, uh, 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 multi-religious uh, society where people, where neighbors lived together in relative harmony and peace. Yes. Uh, Jews, Christians, Muslims, and the rest. Wally, thanks for that correction. And uh, of course, uh, you're exactly right. Hanny, I want you to, I want you to, uh, now I want you to take some time answering this one. Uh, I don't want you to feel the time constraints because these two events that took place in your life really were watershed moments and led to your activism. The first one, you were in school, March 30th, 1976, Land Day, a student protest. Israeli soldiers enter your classroom. Wakif ya haiwan, stand up, you animal, they say to you. Uh, and you ask yourself, what did I do to deserve this? Which led to what you call your thirst for justice. The second, your father's courageous defiance when he applied to the Israeli government for a tax exemption on an imported car. So, I want you to just really, since these are so important, I don't want you to feel any time constraints here. Just share with us how those two led to your activism. These two incidents probably were the most influential in my entire life because of the impact that they had on me as, as a person, as a human being. The first one, uh, as many know, the Palestinians uh, commemorate uh, national holidays and uh, on that day, the students from the school decided to go out and demonstrate and uh, throwing stones at passing by Israeli uh, soldiers, uh, jeeps, and settlers. And as a result, uh, usually the Israeli army is called to control the situation. And they come in, and if the situation escalates, they will start uh, you know, using water cannons and they use colored ink to identify those uh, students who are rock throwers. And then at some point they decide or they may decide to invite the, invade the school uh, to, uh, to, to uh, arrest those who are responsible. Uh, and that's what happened on that day. The Israeli army came in and they invaded the school. And uh, uh, obviously they, they are heavily armed and they come into each classroom they come in, uh, you know, in groups of four or five, and they ask the students to stand up. Obviously, I could not stand up, and I, uh, and a soldier approached me and he said, "You high one, you animal." I told you to stand up, and that's when my teacher jumped in and, you know, yelled and said, "Leave him alone. He he can't stand up. You know, he has a disability." And at that moment, at that moment, this is probably what I remember the most is when the soldier looked into my eye into my eyes and kind of, uh, you know, he just did not know what to say, obviously did not, did not uh, uh, say I'm sorry, did not apologize. It's a sign of weakness. And I said that in my book and he did not want to apologize. And, uh, but nevertheless, I looked into his eyes and, and kind of at that moment, we, we, uh, we identified, you know, the, the, uh, uh, our basic humanity, humanity at a time when, when uh, I was felt, uh, I felt hum humiliated, uh, insulted, uh, uh, but again, 
no apology. Uh, that that stood with me uh, all the years. Uh, another another uh, story is when my father uh, applied at Beit Il. Beit Il is the is the military headquarters uh, for uh, the Israeli occupation near the city of Ramallah at that time. And uh, my dad had a, uh, an interview with the uh, with the uh, representative from that military headquarters for a car exempt uh, exemption for taxes in order for him to purchase a vehicle. Now, uh, if you want to purchase a vehicle uh, at that time, even today, the taxes, the import tax on a vehicle is as much as, is as will cost you as much as a car itself. So it's a, it's a big deal. And uh, for disabled Israelis, any, any family with a disabled child, uh, they could import a vehicle uh, without paying that import tax. So that's the reason why my dad decided to apply. But again, when the time for the interview came, uh, the, the authority, the Israeli authority asked my, the, the guy who interviewed my father, asked him, you know, what have you done for the state of Israel? And I said, my dad said, you know, what are you expecting me to do for the state of Israel? You're occupying us. You are consuming our human rights. Uh, what are you trying to say? I mean, uh, there's nothing on earth I will do to an occupying country. Uh, and at that moment, uh, the, uh, the uh, representative said, application denied, have a good day. And that was, again, another uh, incident that stood with me because uh, it remained in, you know, engraved in my, in my heart uh, as a painful memory uh, because uh, we were not able to, my dad, could, that man could not purchase a vehicle, a reliable vehicle. Uh, he ended up purchasing a, a used vehicle uh, that he managed to use to take me back and forth to school. Uh, but before having that vehicle, I was relying on a public uh, transportation. I was relying on uh, family members who would stop by in the morning, pick me up on their way to school and take me on back home and on, on the way back, you know, so. so these two, you know, experiences, uh, they were tragic uh, in, in a sense. Uh, and I, you know, uh, again, I've wondered about, uh, you know, why? What, what have I done to deserve all of that, uh, among many other questions? You talk about, quote, social and religious values and traditions played a significant role in the development of people's attitudes toward me as a disabled person. Difference and diversity were seldom seen as sources of such things as strength, alternative perspectives, pluralism, and acceptance through insight. Tell us what it meant to grow up with a physical disability uh, in uh, Palestine and what you've learned. The, you know, again, uh, you've traveled to the Middle East uh, many, many times, and you know the religious lenses that through which people look at different aspects of life. And uh, when I was living in Nablus, I felt uh, the sympathy that others had toward me. And I felt the, 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 their, you know, uh, the way they justified uh, my disability by saying, well, this is God's will. And I fully understand that's, that's my luck, God's will, call it whatever you want to call it. Uh, but in the end, uh, I think that uh, I really want empathy rather than sympathy. I want understanding rather than uh, isolation or uh, kind of you know. There, there were there were moments where the there were you know mean mean people around me who, who actually uh, were mocking me and making fun of me. The way I walked, the way I uh, I kind of when I fell down and I was trying to get help to get up again, you know, just. Uh, there were, I mean, you know, we all live in, in, a, in we, we can all relate to that. There are many good people around us, but at times there are mean people around us. Yeah. Well, there's so much more we can talk about, about your growing up in Palestine, but I want to transition now to your time in, in the United States, if that's okay. Uh, here, here's what you say. The first 18 years of my life stand as a testimony to the struggles of a wounded spirit in a wounded land. The 38 years since my arrival in America 
stand as a testimony to how I have determined to live to the fullest of my abilities and defeat the many typical and prejudicial perceptions of people with disabilities found in an even open and democratic society. This transition, I mean, was, uh, I mean, it was necessary because you felt like you would get the education, uh, the further education, and also the help with your disability. And that's one, those are two of the reasons why you emigrated to the US. But what a, what a transition you had to make. It is, it is a, it was a huge, huge transition. And 18 and, years old. I mean, a, young, a, a boy still. Yes, there, there was no question about it. And of course, I was just a recent graduate of, from high school. I did not speak English fluently at all. I, I just, uh, the culture was very uh, new to me. Uh, uh, the, 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 the whole system is just a new system of, of uh, altogether. I, I, I managed because I, I, I associated myself with friends, uh, dear friends, and I mentioned a couple of them. Uh, Michael Peluso and and uh, another the two Michaels in my book. I'm going to ask was, you about I'm going to ask you about the two Michaels in the next question. Michael so it's Reddit, wonderful. Well, yeah, yeah. Well, yes, go ahead. I kind I kind of I, I dived in. You know, I dived in and and I was determined to learn as much as possible from the lives of others who lived similar circumstances, just like mine. I mean, uh, both Michaels, Michael Peluso and Michael Brennan, uh, they were paraplegics and. Uh, Michael uh, is a pioneer. I, I talk about his life in my book uh, in New York, and he, he, his contributions to the lives of the disabled in terms of shaping policies and influencing uh, policy and policymakers regarding stability and disability movements uh, were instrumental. I learned so much from them. And uh, uh, my brother then was, I was able to live with my brother for a year and a half and his wife, Anne, I mentioned both in my book as well. And they were very instrumental in providing the support that I needed to kind of make that adjustment or go through that adjustment. But the bottom line is I was determined to dive in. I was determined to learn about this new culture rather than uh, 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 you know, uh, isolate myself from it or, uh, but rather you know, just wanted to be a, an engaging person so I engaged myself and that engagement uh, led to transformation. And that's precisely what happened in my life. I was able to transform my life from that that I lived in the Middle East or the circumstances that I lived in the Middle East in Nablus to new circumstances, to new, a new reality, a new, uh, a new environment, a new climate that I was uh, willing to uh, accept, learn from, and it paid off. You anticipated my next two questions, actually, because uh, you arrive at JFK Airport on August 12, 1983. Your brother, Nabil, was waiting to take you to Syracuse, where you lived with him and his wife, Anne. Uh, and then you talk about the two Michaels. And I would encourage the readers of the book to, to linger as you talk about this transition. I mean, this is an important part of your book. Uh, tell us about Michael Peluso a little bit more and Arise. I mean, you talked about both yes. of the Michaels as paraplegics yes. and how much you learned from them, but Arise uh, is really important for you. Arise is an independent living center that uh, uh, basically uh, held workshops and uh, devoted its uh, activities and energy toward the lives of disabled. Uh, workshops regarding different types of disabilities, uh, physical disabilities, uh, uh, of different sorts, uh, uh, the the uh, I remember the the project that Arise took uh, on itself, and that is trying to make uh, public transportation uh, in Syracuse wheelchair accessible. Syracuse is known to be the first city in the United States where public transportation buses uh, became wheelchair accessible. Really, and I speak and I speak about an interesting story when Michael Belusa invited me to participate in a demonstration in downtown Syracuse where uh, uh, you know people were asked to shackle themselves using uh, chains to the buses uh, trying to stop them from moving 
you know, shouting, we want to ride too, we want to ride too, you know, <laughs> and, and uh, there's no question, Michael Peluso, uh, he passed away uh, at the age of 60 a couple of years ago, and, uh, and uh, uh, that was, that was uh, very sad news to me because uh, he was the person that I uh, learned the most from. Uh, he was courageous and uh, uh, he was a role model. Uh, he was determined, uh, and, uh, and and he was a huge asset. And he would invite me, hey, you know, come on to these workshops. You'll learn a lot about different stuff. You know, what's different stuff? Are you talking about, Michael? Well, any stuff you want to learn about. What do you want to learn about? Anything. You know, human, you know, uh, sexuality for the disabled. Uh, just talk, you know, uh, uh, social justice issues activism, uh, you know, policies, shaping policies. How do you want to, you know, make change? And I mean, just you learn so much from being in a group, among a group of people with disabilities, uh, all having uh, one common interest, and that is to be seen as equals in society and, and be treated as equals in society. And that's the legacy of Michael Pelusa and Michael Brennan. I, I want you to say a word about your family, uh, Hanny. Uh, first, your wife, Diane. You began, I mean, my gosh, what a story. You began as her kid's babysitter. And uh, uh, now you've been married for almost 32 years. You raised her two kids, your stepkids, Danielle and Roy. You opened your home to foster kids. You adopted children. Tell us about Diane and also the rest of your family. Diane is, is without a question is the best thing that happened to me in, in, in my entire life. I mean, she, she's, I mean, you know, everybody can say something similar about their spouses after uh, so many years of marriage. But, but really, when you think about the commitment that she has undertaken, it's enormous. I mean, uh, you know, uh, I know that some of, uh, some of us here met Diane and, uh, in, in this Zoom meeting. And they know Diane very well, uh, but she has been an asset throughout my life. Every day, I mean, every day is a day that is that begins with Diane, and every day is a day that ends with Diane. And everything that happens between the morning and the evening, uh, the beginning and the end of the day, is because of Diane. So she has been an enormous help for me. She has been an enormous support for me. She has been an enormous, enormous, uh, you know. Uh, uh, loving wife, I mean, her love, uh, not only for me, but for the entire family. Uh, she is a, a keeper, I mean, a family keeper, and she is a, someone who deeply cares about, uh, about humanity, and uh, that shows uh, through her commitment to, to me and, and everyone in the family. But, uh, I I mean, I, I grew in my respect increasingly as I read your book. I mean, here you are, a disabled man. Uh, you raise her two kids, your, your two kids together. Uh, and then you decide to foster kids. And then you decide to adopt kids. I mean, uh, uh, um, you wouldn't call it brave. That would be something that maybe I would say. But uh, talk to us about that process. Well, I think the, the love that I have received uh, from my parents and from my immediate family and the love that I have received from my newly adopted country uh, in a way uh, pushed me to wanting to say thank you in a very meaningful way. I, I wanted to take that love and spill it over to someone else. I mean, I don't know how many of you know about the lives of uh, foster children, uh, but they live very, very difficult lives. Many of them move from one home to another, to another, to another, and they do not live a stable life. And I kind of, me and Diane felt the enormous amount of suffering that these kids go through uh, as foster children. And we wanted to kind of make a difference uh, in their lives as much as we could and uh, by offering them uh, a permanent home. So fostering led to uh, adoption, and adoption, in a way, led to their freedom, hopefully, because they choose, I believe, again, in freedom. 
And I believe that uh, one has the right to choose how they want to live, where they want to live, when they are at the right age. And three of the adopted children uh, decided to move on with their lives at the age of 18, which was fine with us as long as they understood the ramifications. We still have uh, our fourth and last adopted child in the, in the home, Zoe. And I speak about her as well in the book. And uh, Zoe is now 16 years old and uh, she's doing well at school. And, uh, you know, the, the idea was to, uh, you know, practice honest and good citizenship by opening our home to uh, children who deserved a home. I didn't, I didn't think that this uh, conversation would complete without would be complete without you sharing about the love and you the love that you and Diane have for each other and how that is has manifested itself in in greater ways with your foster kids and uh, uh, your adopted kids. Uh, Henny, a major subtext throughout your book is what I would call your disability activism. You've been recognized by the Muscular Dystrophy Association and other organizations for your work. You've spoken in uh, Jordan and uh, uh, Palestine and you're in, in, in uh, throughout the Middle East and Nablus. And here in the US, you've spoken to uh, students who have disabilities and you've been an advisor and a friend to them. Tell us, tell us what you've told uh, them, these, these students and, and kids with disabilities and what you've learned about human potential from them along the way? There's a great human potential for everyone, including people with disabilities. There's no question about that. I think that uh, uh, there are different ways we can help uh, each other. There are different ways we can help the disabled, uh, regardless of where they are. Uh, uh, the potential is, is there because uh, humanity, uh, there's, there's no monopoly over humanity. Uh, we're all in the end equal. We're all uh, struggling to shape our lives in the most meaningful possible way. And I think that lending hand to others and uh, uh, allowing them to uh, live their dreams uh, can be extremely uh, a noble cause and very helpful to Many, for example, when I came to the United States, uh, I was able to obtain my first electric wheelchair, although I was not a US citizen, so I could not qualify for any public funding, even to purchase a wheelchair. But the Muscular District Association uh, was able, given it's a private organization, was able to provide me with my first electric wheelchair. Uh, that electric wheelchair opened avenues and, and new horizons for me. I was able to go places freely, I was able to go to college freely. I was able to uh, just uh, exercise my daily normal activities uh, without any limitations. Uh, of course, I was not able to uh, use public transportation at the beginning at Syracuse because it was not wheelchair accessible. But believe me, at some point, I was traveling from where I lived in South Campus in Slocum Heights, uh, which is about a mile away from main campus uh, on a bus, on buses that became wheelchair accessible. In other words, I did not have to rely on any private transportation, but rather I would get up in the morning, be with everyone else at the bus stop. And here is the bus stop and the, the bus driver stopping and the wheelchair lift comes out of the bus. And here I am on the bus with them, going to campus with them. I'm feeling just like them. And I think they also learned something from that. I learned, you know, that I'm free at last uh, in a way, but I'm sure that uh, they've learned something as well. So I think we learn a lot about our common humanity by allowing ourselves to indulge into the lives of one another and learning more about the lives of one another. You know, before the interview began today, Henny, you and I were talking about, um, I asked you, you know, about how, how many disabled students and young people around the world have you uh, been able to address? And you said it was in the thousands. And, and then you shared something very 
very poignant with me. You said, well, I, in many cases, they in in, in uh, at Mercer and in other places you've been, they've searched you out and you become a trusted friend. And then you said, and not only people with uh, visible disabilities, but people with invisible disabilities. And that's and, yes. it, and, and, and so talk to us about that, please. And that's precisely why I said thousands, because I think that there are many of us who have invisible disabilities that, uh, uh, you know, we think that their lives are kind of very, very normal when, when uh, they actually are going through difficult uh, times or difficult challenges. Uh, I don't know, to be honest with you, how I'm going to define disability. I can define physical disabilities, but disability as, as a, an umbrella uh, of, of uh, different types. I mean, I think we can, we can say that we all have uh, uh, disabilities of, of one sort or another. Uh, but again, the way that Michael Peluso and Michael Brennan impacted my life as one individual, I'm going to follow that, that same, that same uh, uh, path and hopefully impact as many people as I could in helping them achieve their uh, dreams. And that is my goal in life. I think if I want to leave something behind, I want to leave one thing and that is, I'm trying to help everyone else achieve uh, their goals to become uh, independent, uh, to achieve their uh, uh, goals, whether gaining employment or having a family or uh, even traveling abroad, you know, just, I was uh, so uh, blessed by being able to uh, travel around the, the, the world and and be with others and learn from others and uh, and and by this this in and by itself uh, allows people to interact and allow them to think ponder about uh, not only my life but also about their lives. Thank you. Uh, one of the themes that dominates uh, the really the second half of your book and your professional career is uh, your collaboration with Professor Colin Hannaford and, and, and the relationship, I mean, that personal relationship, but even more the theme of your work together, which is the, the relationship between education, particularly mathematics education and what you call reasoning for democracy, or as you call it elsewhere, Citizen education, citizenship education through mathematics and science. Talk to us about how those are related. Citizenship education through mathematics and science. My undergraduate degree is in mathematics and I taught math in high schools for 15 years before the second half of my career. So I really found this interesting, Hanny, please. If we want to be able to resolve conflicts, if we want to be able to meet challenges, we need reason. We need uh, 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 to be able to debate. We need to be able to be respectfully, obviously. We need to be able to uh, uh, justify. We need to be able to explain. And in my view and in uh, the view of my colleague Colin Hannaford, we felt that the best way to achieve that is through Mathematics, it is the tool for reasoning. It is the, it's, it's the, it's the tool and it, you know, that allows us to ask questions. It's the tool that allows us to do our best in terms of reaching consensus. And as we uh, try to meet those challenges facing us around the globe, we need consensus. We need some sort of an agreement. And I believe that mathematics and the sciences allow for that because the tools that they provide are tools that are not only uh, necessary uh, in terms of the applied aspects of mathematics and science, but also in terms of moving humanities forward. We need reason, we need consensus. We need to be able to debate respectfully and calmly with reason. Uh, and I think that mathematics is the backbone for that. And of course, that's why Rene Descartes called mathematics the queen of the sciences, right? Indeed. Yes. <laughs> uh, um, we're coming to a close. I've got about just a few more questions, but um, 
you mentioned so many teachers and colleagues uh, back in Nablus, but then also here in America uh, who've helped shape your philosophy of education and your teaching, and uh, they became fast friends. There were, there were many, like I say, but for now, I'd like you to focus on two of them and their impact in your life, Professor Elena Levy and Dr. Dwayne Davis. Tell us about them. Uh, Elena Levy is the, the uh, person, the teacher, the mentor that I met when I was a student at Onondaga Community College. When I came to Syracuse, New York in 1983, she was among the first teachers I met. And she was a teacher at, uh, in the mathematics department at OCC. Uh, and uh, we kind of became, we, we really became friends quickly. It didn't take us a long time to transform that. Uh, I, I was not a student of her in the classroom, but I was helping her in her classroom because I was, uh, I was excelling in mathematics and I was helping some of her students in her basic uh, math uh, classrooms that she was teaching. And Elena uh, was an activist in the Syracuse community. She was a, uh, an activist in Women in Black, and that is a human rights organization that protested the Israeli occupation of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. And she was participating in demonstrations in Syracuse against that occupation. And, uh, you know, as a Jewish friend of mine, uh, and I hold her very, very dearly to my heart, she became uh, uh, a mentor in a, in a meaningful way because her reputation in the mathematics department at OCC was incredible. She was loved by all, of her by all of her students, by her colleagues. She was really a role model, not only for me, but for many others. And, uh, and I really wanted to know more about her teaching. How does she approach uh, teaching uh, mathematics to uh, especially those who have anxieties and fears uh, of, of, from learning mathematics? And uh, years later, I decided actually to continue my, to, to do my PhD dissertation uh, on, on, on Elena and her classroom. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. it was such a privilege. Uh, she is just a, an incredible human being. Uh, and uh, I've learned from her so much about humanity, about teaching, about mathematics, about uh, students' anxieties about mathematics, and how to really uh, make students uh, transform that anxiety into true dedicated love toward mathematics. And Dwayne, uh, and Dwayne Davis wrote the foreword to your book. The Dwayne wrote the foreword to my book, and uh, Dwayne was the first person I met uh, coming to Mercer University. That was on April 15, 1994, a day I will never forget. That was the day I had my interview at Mercer, and Dwayne met me and my family, my wife and uh, Dwayne Danielle at the Hampton Inn in Forsyth, and uh, and a journey of, uh, now we're, we're almost 30 years we've been together as colleagues. Uh, Duane is, is a great uh, friend, not only to me, but to the entire college, to the entire university, Mercy University. He's a great human being, a wonderful human being. And uh, he's a father figure for me. I mean, I, I you know, uh, he's, he's been a great supporter uh, of mine and, and uh, uh, I've learned so much from it as well. Henny, uh, you, you returned. Um, you returned to Jordan and back home to Palestine in October 2018, after being gone for 35 years since you first left in 1983. You first visited Jordan and spoke there and <clears throat> did some uh, work there. Um, with some children's camps that Queen Noor had established. Then crossing the Allenby Bridge back, to, uh, you, you traveled through Jericho and then back to Nablus, you met with school officials and students with disabilities at Anaja National University. But what moved me was uh, as you returned home to Nablus, you described your quote, mixed emotions, quote, the exuberance and sadness that filled my soul. And you close your book with reflections on a six day visit. Uh, and then before the interview, you said, 
my gosh, there was no sign of my childhood here. Talk to us just really about your return back home, all the mixed feelings and what you learned. Uh, what were some of your reflections on this visit back home? You know, when you leave your, your birthplace for 35 years and you return for the very first time, there's no question in my mind that everyone probably feel the same way about their childhood, about memories, about, uh, you know, places that have been schools, uh, homes that you, uh, uh, you grew up in. You know, the, my house that I grew up in uh, was not there. It was, it was completely gone. It was uh, uh, demolished and a, a building, a, a kind of, I think it was 12 floors high or so was built, uh, you know, over that place. Remember that the Palestinians are not able to expand horizontally due right. to limitations. The occupation obviously makes it difficult for them to expand horizontally. So really, if you visit Nablus today, you'll see many buildings that are 10 or 12 floors high because that's the only way they can expand and that is vertical expansion. So you have people living in buildings rather than independent homes. But, but going back and going back on a visa rather than going back as a citizen of that place had a lot of you know, impact. I mean, I just, uh, on me, I, I felt that, you know, even though I was very happy to uh, go back and see, uh, visit with my friends and meet with them. And, you know, even if I could find a teacher here or there and just to talk with them and kind of go back 35 years in time and talk about uh, childhood memories, you know, all of that brings uh, a, a toll of emotions on, on, on you. Uh, because you're going back to a place that, uh, you know, the place that I left, in a way, I did not leave it. I, I, you know, did I want to leave? Yeah, of course, given the circumstances I was living, yeah, I wanted to leave. But a part of me, like anyone else, remains home. But again, as I said in my book, home is where your dreams unfold. America, my, my place here is home now. And... Uh, you know, there's no problem with me having multiple homes uh, in this world because that's who I am. I think that if I, part of me belongs there and part of me belongs here, although it creates sometimes a lot of suffering and, 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 and uh, instability, uh, but, but why not? I mean, I, 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 uh, I feel that the part of me lives here and the part of me lives there, and that is to be expected. I've got one more question for you uh, before we close, and then I'm going to give you a, a final word uh, uh, at the end. But there was an exchange you had with a professor at Syracuse that I think summarizes your life and your spirit. It's an exchange with a professor, Ferdinand Molina, a philosophy professor at Syracuse, who you'd catch up with sometimes in your electric wheelchair on his walk to campus. I don't know if you remember this story or not, but one snowy day you had caught up with him and he said, why do you insist on coming to campus in this damn cold and snowy weather on your wheelchair? And your answer and his reply, what he learned from you says a lot about who you are. Um, you wanna tell us the, the rest of the story? I have it written here, but why don't you tell us? Yes, he, will, he, he asked me that question. And you know, my response is, is why not? And I was responding with a smile on my face. And uh, you know, he, he, uh, we walked together to campus. And uh, once we got to campus, he told me, Hany, I've learned something new from you. I said, Professor Molina, what have you learned from me? You're a professor of philosophy and I think you know all of life back and forth by now. He said, I've learned something unique, and that is to challenge your life and to face it with a smile on your face. And I think that is precisely uh, what I would like others to do. And that is to challenge life with a smile on their face, because at the end of the day, hope is what remains and hope is what moves us. And, uh, you know, uh, we Palestinians, I told him, uh, have, learned to challenge life with a smile on our face. The Palestinian people have 
paid a huge price, a dear price, uh, under the Israeli occupation. But I am absolutely certain that Palestine will become an independent state, hopefully sooner than later, because of the uh, determination that the Palestinian people have to achieve their independence and their freedom. I, I love this exchange you had. He says, you Palestinians love life. And you said, our love for life stems from our resistance in life. I learned something new from you, honey, to challenge the world while smiling. I thought that was very profound. And just maybe as, a, as an addendum, that leads then to the title of your book, Giving Up is Not an Option. That you chose the title for your book. Yes, uh, that's probably was the most difficult thing for, for me to, I wrote the book and then I did not choose a title, although uh, <laughs> I always, you know, many of us will probably go through the same thing when they write a book. What's, the, what, what's going to be a good title for that book? And once uh, I was visiting with my friend, uh, Reverend uh, Abakal in Atlanta, on the way back, uh, my driver and I were driving back and uh, the reason we, I, I went to Atlanta and, and met with Fahid, because uh, me and Fahid met with the illustrator for the book, uh, who uh, designed the cover of the book. And uh, at that time, I did not have a title yet. But on the way back, the driver and I were driving back to Macon. And I told her, Gwen, Gwen something came to mind. She said, what? I, I told her, I think I got the title for the book. She said, what? I said, I think I got a title for my book. And she said, what is it? And I said, giving up is not an option. And uh, it's just uh, because of the, the meaning I had with the illustrator, I had to summarize the book. I had to kind of uh, go through the book in about one hour, like our meeting today, to explain to her the, the themes that are in the book in order for her to come up with a design for the cover. And as a result, I think on the way back, uh, that exercise allowed me to come up with the right title for the book. Giving up is not an option. Well, I will say just as someone who's, who's a new friend of yours, that to, to challenge the world with a smile and giving up is not an option is not only a good title for a book, but it's a, it's a good title for Hanny's life. So uh, any parting words for us today? First of all, I want to thank all of you for being here. Uh, it's, it's nice to see all of you, uh, those who I know and those who I do not. Uh, but I think that if I want to ask you for one thing, and that is uh, to work together, uh, because I think in the end, achieving justice and peace and harmony in our lives is a collective thing, is not an individual thing. And I think that working together as people of goodwill will achieve the desired results. Uh, I know there are lots of uncertainty, uncertainties in this world, but in the end, I think that uh, the goodwill of many people from all walks of life, from different faiths and backgrounds, will ultimately bring about justice and peace as we all envision it. And uh, once again, I want to thank you and I hope you'll be able to read my book. And if you have any questions, please feel free to email me. The email uh, is in the book and I'll be happy to respond to you. I want to thank Michael for this wonderful opportunity. Thank you, Michael, from the bottom of my heart. And thanks to all of you.